So the way that she obtains the May is um, in a very Luciferian way, and you could almost say that Inanna has a lot in common with Lucifer because he was the one that took the fire from God's and brought it down back to earth um, for mankind to enlighten him. But in this story, she is called the Holy Torch, which is also a symbol of Lucifer. And so Ishtar had been worshipped by sacred prostitution in her earlier incarnation as Inanna. The practice reached its height in Babylon, which is why the goddess is remembered in Christian mythology as the Whore of Babylon. Hello all, I would like to share with you this video from Freeman Fly's YouTube channel. There's some really good information in this video and I think you will all agree once you see it. The one thing that I should say off the uh, at the beginning of this is that the presenter of this video is at a conference and this conference is not necessarily for Christians and the speaker may not be a Christian at all for all I know. And and the audience, like I said, may not like I hinted at may not be Christian at all. But that is um I know some people may be sensitive to that, but the truth or the reality of the situation is you're not always going to get your information from people who are Christian or people who are saved. Sometimes you have to be willing to li to listen to a wide variety of people in order to get information on what's going on in the world. So for those who are sensitive to this, um, well, I, I honestly, after watching this, I don't believe you'll have a problem with it once you actually see it. And but I'm just I'm just making this statement because some people are sensitive to that. But for the most part, I don't think there's going to be a problem with with this at all. So um, I think you'll enjoy it. And with that said, um, please enjoy the video. One of the first cities in the world was called Uruk, and one of its kings was the renowned Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh, like I said, he thought of himself as two-thirds god and one-third man, and his mortality is the conflict of the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is one of the oldest texts that's ever been discovered in the world, probably the first book ever written. And he was always very vexed because he was part human and... Um, only the gods live forever, and he wanted to live forever. So in Gilgamesh's character, we see somewhat of a person who is obsessed with fame and uh, intense preoccupation with his reputation and um, sort of a revolt against his part man nature. And then on the other slide next to him is Enkidu, which Enkidu was a sort of beast master who was born with the wild animals. And in the story, they want to tame him um, so that he can be a companion to Gilgamesh because Gilgamesh is wearing out the humans with his decrees and his ruling that all the brides had to first be with him on their wedding night before they could be with their husband. So the people of... <laughs> Sumer were like, we need help, so they go to the gods, and the gods create Enkidu so that Gilgamesh could have somebody to wrestle with and preoccupy him. And Enkidu was actually subdued in the story um, from the wilderness to come to the city to, to be friends with Gilgamesh by a prostitute. So we'll get into prostitution in just a second. <laughs> but the, the tales of these ancient gods, uh, it proves that they were never... Um, benevolent, all-knowing, all-loving deities, only that they were physically and technologically superior. So they were given to all manner of earthly desires and emotions and competitive, competitiveness, hunger, fear, jealousy, sadness, anger, and love. Uh, their contention and their empire building and their city-state building were the driving force behind early civilization, and human beings in these stories were simply caught in the middle, at, you know, uh, under the will of the gods, right? And under them were the priests. So we were talking about the priesthood a little bit before. And the temples of the gods were always in the heart of the city, and that's what the city was built around. And they were served by a perpetual priesthood, and these were the writers, teachers, scholars, astrologers, 
And this priest class was almost the uh, most elite class because they dictated the religion, right? So a priest could be above a king because he had the spiritual power. And so the, almost all of the temporal power of society was in the hands of the priests of these mystery schools and the estates that they managed, which was the entire city almost. So this is Inanna. And this is the Sumerian goddess who overshadowed and outlasted all of the other gods at the time. She is the goddess with a thousand names and a thousand incarnations. And she was worshipped in a great temple in Uruk along with the father of the gods, Anu. And she was known as the queen of heaven, um, both an awful and lovely goddess of love, war, sex, and death. And so she is probably the most important goddess of you know the entire history and we'll get into why I think that this is what's being incarnated um, through popular culture at this time. So she was um, always depicted as both a shy virgin and also a sensuous mistress and she was a powerful warrior who drove a chariot drawn by lions which were her sacred animal and it's interesting at the beginning of time you have these uh, hunter-gatherers that are just starting to form um, towns and, and cities and things, and then you have the arrival of these beings, and then you have a ziggurat. So it's like, how did these people go from living in mud huts to building ziggurats and you know, accomplishing great feats of architecture, and it was the arrival of these beings and that they're depicting right here. And so they came to love the city and more than nature and more than wilderness. I mean, the Sumerians, if you read their uh, testimonies, they loved civilization more than Carrie Bradshaw loves New York City, right? Like, it's the same idea, uh, this metropolis, the idea of getting everybody together, concentrated uh, so that they're more easily controllable and that they don't get the divine energies from the nature that they're supposed to be getting because we're all surrounded by buildings and bricks and streets and cars and, uh, and everything that disconnects us from, you know, God and creation, right? So Inanna's strongest cults were in the cities that were most notable for trade, such as Phoenicia, where also Freemasonry comes from. And they despised the wilderness and their definition of a wicked and a person was an uncivilized person who lived in the mountains and didn't practice agriculture. So it was, in fact, it was Inanna herself who was most responsible for civilization as we know it in the first place because there is a story where Inanna arrives in Uruk, her city, and um, she arrives with these objects they call the May. It's called, uh, pronounced May, but it's spelled M-E. And these were the various types of supernatural objects and ideas that amounted to civilization. So where does the idea of real estate come from, kingship, uh, let's see the list here, it says, oh, it says the May is a set of rules and regulations assigned to each cosmic entity and cultural phenomenon for the purpose of keeping it operating forever. So the way that she obtains the May is um, in a very Luciferian way, and you could almost say that Inanna has a lot in common with Lucifer because he was the one that took the fire from God's and brought it down back to earth um, for mankind to enlighten him. But in this story, she is called the Holy Torch, which is also a symbol of Lucifer. And she was anxious to increase the welfare and prosperity of Uruk and make it the center of civilization, the center of the world, right? And so she goes to um, the realm of the gods and she gets drunk with Enki, one of the creator gods, and he gives her the May and says, these are yours and you can take these back to your city. And so basically you are the, the queen of earth now because you have this set of rules for uh, governing humanity. So in this list, there's like almost a hundred things listed, including um, crowns, tiaras, the throne, the staff, the measuring rod in line. You can see on the right side, she's holding like a circle and a, a bar. So this is how they would measure off real estate for agriculture and planting is they would take a, a stick and put it in the ground and then tie a rope around it. Very easy way to, you know, 
partition off uh, pieces of land for real estate and ownership. Um, she also brought uh, the idea of priests and priestesses. She brought the idea of uh, the sacred marriage, of uh, weapons, ceremonial robes, hairstyles, lovemaking. I mean, the list goes on and on. Music, the art of the hero, metalworking, um, fire. So there you go. So she brought fire to mankind. Um, so yeah, the May were the, the Sumerian values um, and governing structures that organized their society. And they were conferred by the gods onto the king priests, who was supposed to be like uh, the god on earth. And he was the representative of the god on earth. And uh, it was his job to ensure the continuation of the civilization the way that the gods saw fit. So, Inanna's May also included uh, public lovemaking and uh, the kissing of the phallus and temple prostitution. And these were ritualistically performed doing, during their New Year's festivals in the spring and autumn called the Akitu. And so imagine coming out twice a year uh, to see your neighbors going at it on the designated day because this was the day for fertility and this all came, the idea of doing this uh, in public came from these ancient gods. So, you know, if you were Sumerian, you might not have been so shocked at what you were seeing on television today because maybe it was nothing compared to back then. But there's a good quote here. It says, our own demographic is very strange in comparison to the usual experience of humankind. Young people moved to the cities of their own free will, so their cities were essentially young adult societies. The closest modern comparison would be the mid-1960s when the baby boomers came of age. When the baby boomers were young adults, the elderly still were not living that long and birth control became readily available. It was the age of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was similar to Sumerian society. So, the Akkadians of Mesopotamia, they incorporated um, the Sumerian culture wholesale and melded their goddess Ishtar, I mean Inanna with Ishtar. And so the identification of these two goddesses was partly due to Sargon the Great, a great king, not a great one, but an important one, um, who conquered Sumer and most of Western Asia. And so to help him control the restless and rebellious populations of the Sumerian cities, he appointed his daughter as high priestess and spouse of the moon god um, Ur and of the sky god in Uruk. And so for 40 years, she held this priestly office and wielded great power among the Mesopotamians. And she elevated the Inanna Ishtar hybrid as the supreme goddess of the empire and gave her the rank, the queen of heaven. And she is remembered today primarily as the first poet in recorded history who actually has a name, it was a woman. So it was at this time that <laughs> The insatiable ambition of kings was transformed from the idea of winning the favor of the goddess of love and war to rule their city-states um, into one of uh, more of a world domination. And so Ishtar had been worshipped by sacred prostitution in her earlier incarnation as Inanna, the practice reached its height in Babylon, which is why the goddess is remembered in Christian mythology as the whore of Babylon. And so besides the many time, uh, full-time temple whores that they had working there, uh, the act of this sacred prostitution, they told them that it was a way for women to identify with the goddess and receive her blessing and fertility, and for men to be blessed um, by the conjugation with an honest representative. And so this type of religious sexuality might sound glamorous, but it is highly unlikely that the prostitutes were voluntary. Um, you know, prostitution is slavery. I don't think anyone is gonna argue that, but they tried to make it as glamorous and sexy and desirable and not as shameful as we all know it is. And so what I have here is uh, a medieval representation of the whore of Babylon on her great dragon with the, the heads and um, you know the beast of the abyss and it's actually Lady Gaga right um, I don't know if I should throw this in but if you are more interested in learning about that we did a, a very good special on 
the Katy Perry Super Bowl ritual when she arrived in the Super Bowl on top of the lion, right, which was Anana's animal, um, holding the reins in a flaming dress just like the lost card from Aleister Crowley. So if you're more interested in that, I would suggest you check it out. But Ishtar was referred to as the goddess who could change men into women and vice versa. So androgynous priests and priestesses were called reed people and they served in temples as seers of the divine. So people with atypical sexuality were given special status in ancient Sumer and were thought to have abilities of supernatural religious value. And so the Mesopotamian interpretation of Ishtar is uh, a gender bender and as the morning star, uh, Venus is her planet and in the morning it is male and in the evening is female and so in Greece it's also Aphrodite. And so this could be um, a reason why we are seeing this trend um, of mixing the genders together because I think that they're trying to incarnate the, these ideas from the beginning of time. So ancient people were fascinated by hermaphrodites. Um, the spring Akitu festival along with the public ritual of the sacred marriage that was performed by the king and the priestess of Inanna, uh, they also had a parade of cross-dressed worshipers who would wear half men and half woman costumes. And so with a devotional ceremony, they would honor Inanna and rejoin themselves to her light. And so androgynous clothing was symbolic of the goddess, and um, they believed that she existed as the opposite sex of each person. So taverns were also brothels, and they were sacred to the goddess. Um, and sex with a prostitute, like we were talking before, was a religiously sanctioned activity. And this gets pretty dark because boys and girls uh, became prostitutes as children because they were raised in this and only allowed to exit the whorehouse um, and serve in other capacities when they reached adulthood. So temple prostitution was so common in the ancient world that there are many uh, specific verses in the Bible that actually condemn this practice, right? So by the Iron Age, Ishtar was well integrated into the pantheon of most religions, and so um, all goddesses that you see springing up through history, you can trace them back to Inanna. And on the left, you see um, a statue that they found, and these were actually rigged with water, so they would spout water from that little hole that she's holding right there. And um, so throughout the literature in the Bronze Age, kings declared that they were the lovers of Inanna Ishtar, and the story of the courtship of Inanna and Dumuzi established the principle of the sacred marriage for fertility. And it was the relationship between the king and the goddess that was the king's source of power. So human kings of Uruk, they claimed legitimacy, legitimacy to the throne by their emulation of Dumuzi, who was Inanna's husband and her, his favorable relationship with her. So here... The high priestess would unite with the king of the land who represented uh, Dumuzi, and this important festival like we were talking about would last for many days and occur around the time of the autumn equinox. So the cult of priests, they really benefited from preserving the sacred marriage rituals because um, this legitimized new kings coming in to conquer. So when a new king would come and conquer the city, um, instead of... Um, being slaughtered, the priest would come out and say, it's Inanna's uh, will that you have won this battle. You can have our city as long as you keep our ritual and you know, continue to have this sacred fertility public ritual for the people. Um, you're the new king as long as you're making love to Inanna in public. And so it's kind of a win-win for whoever won that city, right? <laughs> but what does this have to do with Hollywood? Oh, here's another picture of, this is called the Investiture of Zimri Lim, King Zimri Lim, and you can see um, Inanna passing the divine right of rulership with the rod and the circle right there to Zimri Lim. 
So Hollywood has been associated with ancient Babylon since its very inception. And during the onset of the Great Depression, many Americans believed that the country's financial hardships were the result of uh, a moral decline. So they were really harping um, a lot on Hollywood and blaming Hollywood for uh, the ills of the country. And they called it Babylon and Sin City. And so ancient, or really no ancient city is more famous for its mysteries than Babylon, whose name literally means Gate of the Gods. And this is Marduk right here. And this is from a, a cartoon called I Am the City from the Real Ghostbusters. And we'll talk a little bit more about Marduk in a second. But Babylon was very much like Los Angeles in the ancient world as an important center of popular culture. And it's not surprising that you know the astrology and the star chart um, comes from Babylon. And in the ancient times, the ziggurat of Etim and Tanki towered over the city, and it was ruled by the god king Marduk. That's this is just a cartoon, but you can go and look at um, <clears throat> ancient depictions of Marduk. But he, uh, let's see. So things kind of changed a little bit when Babylon became the center because the, the rites and rituals uh, switched from the, the focal point being Inanna and the king in the sacred marriage ritual from that to Marduk gaining power over the gods and becoming the king of the gods and the king of Babylon at the same time. So here is the Kodak Theater in the center of downtown Hollywood and Highland. And this opened in 2001, and it is the permanent home of the Academy Awards. And so this is where the Hollywood royalty parades down the red carpet on their way to receiving the Oscars. And the decor is taken from the 1916 movie Intolerance by a Freemason, who is D.W. Griffith. And the ancient Babylonian story in the movie depicts the conflict between Prince Belshazzar of Babylon and Cyrus the Great of Persia. And in the film, the intolerant priests of Marduk, who is also called Bel, uh, attempt to suppress the worship of Ishtar and betray their king. So that's the, the old movie that this is taken from. But this is also an interesting um, arch in itself, right? Because this is the Babylon courtyard, they call it. And they have four story columns topped with standing elephants. And um, if you look through there, you can actually see the Hollywood sign in the background, right? So on either side of the arch are two curious characters. The figure on the left holding the basin of water is similar to the winged genie of Assyrian iconography. And they appear in the reliefs and walls throughout palaces and temples in various ways. Um, and this one is actually on the left. I would say that this is Enki or Ea because he was always depicted as a god of water um, who held a pot of water in his hands or with streams of water erupting from his body. And the creature on the right, do I have a better one? Yeah, there's um, a Syrian eagle god named Nusku who was originally depicted as holding a pine cone-like object. I guess you can see it a little bit in here. They've kind of, it, in the originals, it's a lot bigger and more uh, pronounced, but they've kind of shrunk his little pine cone in his hand. But he is the, the messenger of Marduk and a god of the stylus. So then the squiggly thing between them this is the Assyrian Tree of Life, and this was the original Tree of Life thousands of years before the Kabbalah, depending on which tradition you ascribe to. But there appears to be a general consensus among experts that this uh, tree was related to creation and fertility, and it's a representation of the human body and the ideal man. And uh, it also refers to the organization of the material world by Marduk. And the king is portrayed as the human personification of the tree. And in some representations, the king actually takes the place of the tree of life. So 
The grand entrance into the city of Babylon was called the Ishtar Gate, and it's made with blue bricks and decorated with approximately 120 lions, and which is one, why it's sometimes called the Lion's Gate. And it was excavated in the 20th century and reconstructed in a museum, and it's now at the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. That's where you can find this thing. And so during the celebrations of the, these New Year's Akitu festivals, statues of the deities were paraded, paraded through the gate and down the processional way um, for everyone to worship. And isn't it interesting that so many film companies have this lion motif. There's Lionsgate films. There's, uh, well, and, and Lionsgate actually brought us the, the Twilight and the Hunger Games and American Psycho and all of these negative movies. But um, I just thought that was very interesting that, you know, the Lionsgate of Babylon and now you have the Lionsgate production company, right? So this is in Hollywood, and then you, you can see the little wing genie and the king. Uh, only in Los Angeles can you visit an Assyrian ziggurat and buy corporate crap at a discount. This is an outlet mall. <laughs> um, the Citadel Outlet Mall in Commerce, California is built in 1929, and this is a replica of the fortress of Dur Shurukin of Sargon II and complete with all the battle scenes, the wing genie, the wing bulls, and the, the human head guys called the Lamassu. So um, the Syrians were very uh, hated. They were one of the most fearsome and um, warlike and barbaric uh, civilizations that we've ever studied in history. So they, um, the tales of their bloodthirst and sadism and their perfection at war so having an Assyrian-themed outlet mall is kind of like having a Nazi-themed farmer's market. It's like, it doesn't make sense, but... So let's talk about sorcery for a second. <clears throat> because if it only takes uh, six degrees to get to Kevin Bacon in Hollywood, it takes even less to get to Aleister Crowley. And Thelema, in my opinion, is the hidden religion of the 20th century. And Hollywood is one of the main epicenters for global sorcery and mind control. And so movies are magical ceremonies and their mode of operation is mimicry or sympathy. And some directors know exactly the potent magic power of movies and use it to enlighten or enslave depending on the makers, right? So two hours in front of the screen watching a movie like The Matrix could sufficiently initiate even the most naive person to the level of the first degree of a cult apprentice if they realize what they're watching. So Aleister Crowley's religion, and if you saw in the beginning of uh, the very first slide, that was from the Game of Thrones, and that is their, um, their religion in that show, and it has this same seal of Babylon. So we were talking about Inanna, Ishtar, Hora Babylon. This is what the goddess is turning into now. They're using, uh, Thelemites believe that their goddess Babylon is a composite of Kali and Ishtar and the Hora Babylon from Revelation. So his motto of do what thou wilt is the anthem of the music industry if you listen closely and um, even though he died nearly penniless and fighting a heroin addiction his legacy is nevertheless nothing short of colossal um, Scientology rules in Hollywood and it was created by L. Ron Hubbard who was a protege of Crowley and who took hypnosis and black magic and made it into a long, drawn out and expensive torture session. So Scientology would not be nearly as successful as it is today without its celebrity endorsements. And in the religion of Thelema, it is believed that the history of humanity can be divided into a series of aeons. And each was accompanied by its own forms of magical and religious expression. And the Book of the Law is divided into three sections and talking about the Aeon of Isis, the Aeon of 
Osiris and the Aeon of Horus, which is what they believe that we are in right now, the Aeon of Horus. And this is supposed to be the idea of there's no such thing as sin because Horus is a, like a, a selfish child god. And so even the very idea of something being sinful, they would tell you is a lie and an obstacle to your self-fulfillment. And instead, each person will be governed by their own self-will and self-interest. The feminine counterpart to Horus is where we're talking about the Scarlet Woman, the Babylon, B-A-B-A-L-O-N. And Aleister Crowley was very sexist and held to all the misogynistic notions of the Victorian era. He was struggling against excessive repression and never really treated women as anything but sexual playthings, and he wanted them to behave like nymphomaniacs. He only ever used the women in his life for sex or money or both, and most of the women who got involved with him ended up mentally ill or suffering a uh, drug addiction. And so on the left is one of his scarlet women who he would actually brand with a hot iron on their chest, uh, his version of the mark of the beast, the circle and the cross. And then you have, uh, I put Lady Gaga in there as the scarlet woman, which they will dress them in red. You will notice after an initiation or a big performance, um, they will always reemerge as the scarlet woman. So they call their goddess Babylon the mother of abominations. And um, yeah, her, her god form is based on this, like we were talking about, the sacred whore, Ishtar. And it is believed that she could be invoked to earth and her role could be filled by actual women as the counterpart to his self as the great beast. Um, and help manifest the energies of what they want in this Aeon of Horus. So Aleister Crowley, he actually believed that many of his lovers were playing this um, role to the fulfillment of his prophecy. And the Thelemites believe that the Scarlet Woman, as well as the role of the beast, can be fulfilled by any magician who so chooses. So this is what I think that they're trying to put on these girls who um, are under monarch mind control. Um, when they get deeper in it, they're actually elevated to the level of a scarlet woman. So some people will try to whitewash Crowley as a kind of harmless libertarian Dumbledore kind of figure, but the morals outlined in his teachings contain statements that from a humanitarian point of view are way more than objectionable. And his book is... Uh, anti-compassion, anti-democracy, anti-emotion, anti-sympathy, pity, or brotherly love. And so the chief concern of a Thelemite is following their own individual true will. And so nowhere in the book of the law are you instructed to be concerned with the rights of others. And if the doing of your will includes, you know, hurting someone else or thwarting their rights, then so be it, you know, the might makes right. That's the idea of this whole religion. And not only that, they consider um, whoever can win is deserving, and they even have a, a dictum, the slaves shall serve. So in occult terms, a Thelemite is a dichotomous, seeing himself as a superior being or a chosen one, and while everyone else is nothing. And the concept of following one's true will takes no account for the fact that we exist in an ecosystem and it's not a, a universe unto ourselves because we're sharing the space with everyone else. In the real world, uh, damage to others and your environment equals damage to yourself because we all have to share the space, right? So the book of the law is actually based on social Darwinian feudal stratification and this is what we're talking about, royalty programming. It's the princess and the uh, commoner, right, the, and the peasant. So. Crowley, <clears throat> Crowley belonged to an elite class. Um, he was born with money, and this dictated his view of the world and including his view of an ideal world. And he's, one passage revolves around the idea that the slaves shall serve forever. He says, Yea, deem not change. Ye shall be as ye are and not other. Therefore the kings of the earth shall be kings forever. The slaves shall serve. There is none that shall be cast down or lifted up. All is as it ever was. 
So here, the, um, his feudal ideas are in full force. And what he's saying is there are kings and wealthy people, and there are slaves and beggars, and nothing in the Lima or Hollywood or uh, monarchy is designed to change this paradigm. So there's no promise that slaves will be set free or that beggars will become rich. So to them, the person is either one or the other, and um, they give no reason for believing why this should ever change to them. So he actually said, there's only one solution, to pick out the diamonds from the clay, cut them, polish them, and set them as they deserve. You will observe that I am advocating an aristocratic revolution, and so I am. And remember that Katy Perry royal revolution, right? So his ideal government um, must lord over and manage hordes of ignorant masses. He said we should have no compunction in utilizing the natural qualities of the bulk of mankind. We do not insist on trying to train sheep or hunt foxes or lecture on history. We look after their physical well-being and enjoy their wool and mutton. In this way, we shall have a contented class of slaves who accept the conditions of existence as they really are and enjoy life without the quiet, with the quiet wisdom of a cattle. So here is a photo from Bohemian Grove. And you can see behind them, this is the representation of their ideal society. So you have a priest in front with a staff and, you know, like a pope-like figure. And then you have the, the banker, uh, Aristotelic class, and then you have the, the servants who serve them. And then you have, uh, you know, the businessmen and, and on and on until you get down to peasants. And, uh, you know, just this is the way that they feel that society should be run. And Hollywood is their major uh, mode of indoctrination to make you think that this is true also. So, through these art and artifacts, the ancient kings, uh, they really revealed themselves to be militant and pompous imperialists who thought nothing of deporting entire tribes or torturing prisoners of war to build their kingdoms like Babylon and Uruk. And base released from the cities of Nimrud and Nineveh featuring kings conquering armies, strutting, slaughtering, leading thousands of people, um, deporting them, making them build these buildings. So whenever you see these great giant, okay, good. Uh, whenever you see these uh, feats of architecture, just remember that you know it was built on the backs of real people. And this is actually, the picture is from, what is it? King Sennacherib of Assyria, and he, even in the writings, he gloats and says, I deported them and made them carry the head pet and molded bricks and subjected them to my slavery. So, slavery was a, a recognized institution from the beginning of time, in, even in Mesopotamia society. And so these temples, palaces, and rich estates were owned and exp owned by, you know, the magician priest class, and they exploited slaves in their temple prostitution. So, if we want to see how the Babylon system is working today, you know, look no further than Hollywood, because this is the spell that, uh, you know, ancient people used to use the stars to navigate and to tell time and to, um, you know, to follow the stars was how you got from one place to the other, but now they have everybody looking at these stars in Hollywood who they created instead of the actual stars. So when they were owned by the studio system, that was also a, a sort of form of slavery. You know, the studi studio did as much as possible, even dictating social activities, even down to who a certain star would marry. Um, if a star was gay, they would have to get a fake wife. So they pretty much controlled every aspect of these actor and actresses' life. So. I guess that's it. On the left, you can see uh, Sargon and Inanna again, and they're standing on the backs of slaves. And Free Your Mind, I think, is one of the best places to 
combat this slavery and we're learning all about trauma-based mind control and we're learning about, you know, just the, <coughs> oh crap. All the different ways that our mind is enslaved and so what we have to do first is to start to free our mind. Oh, oh okay. <clears throat> And this starts by freeing your mind, and, and it starts by sharing it with other people. And so don't let this kind of information get you lonely. Um, I wrote these books so that you would have a tool to share in a way that's easy to get people to understand um, what you're trying to tell them. It's full color pictures, and it was written for um, the demographic I was thinking was teenagers, because I think that you know children are the future, and we have to educate them in real things instead of just Hollywood and fake school, and so I really hope you enjoyed my talk, and I hope you will check out my book. of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body should be full of light. But if thine eye or thy light be evil, thy whole body should be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? That was Matthew 6, uh, verse 22 to 23 again, through 23. And back to Zechariah. And he said, This is their resemblance, their eye or their light, through all the earth. And this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. And he said, This is wickedness, evil. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and cast the weight of the lead on the mouth thereof. So I hope I'm not losing anybody here. The light, or eye, is described as a woman. Zechariah 5. That means the Illuminati eye is a woman, and she is called wickedness. Their eye is wickedness, therefore their whole body is full of darkness.